Huge pleasure to be back at the British Library. Thank you, British Library. Thank you, all our sponsors, particularly the Aga Khan, who are sponsoring Aga Khan uh, Trust for Culture, that's sponsoring this session. And a great pleasure to introduce one of my heroes, Warwick Ball, who's written a whole series of fabulous books, uh, which I have carted, I was just telling him, over um, rivers in spate through Afghanistan. And my copy of his uh, uh, Af archaeological guide to Afghanistan is covered with dirt and, uh, uh, and uh, the results of, uh, of bumpy journeys across the Harry Road and other places. A wonderful scholar, also a dirt archaeologist who actually digs sites and, uh, and finds things and, and reconstructs histories. Uh, a brave thinker out of the box. And this book is an extremely ambitious uh, book which connects worlds which are normally seen to be quite distinct. Um, it, is, uh, 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 it is outspoken, brave, wide-ranging. And what we're going to do is have Warwick lay out his float, so to speak, uh, for 20 minutes. I'll then question him for 20 minutes and then we'll hand him over to your tender mercies uh, to, uh, to ask whatever you like uh, for the final third. So, Warwick, off you go. Thank you. Uh, mic's on? Is that okay? Yes. I, we were just being urged to go and travel to the places that I talk about. Um, well, most of what I talk about in this book is Ukraine and Russia which, um, well, one can travel, I think, I'm sure, but uh, perhaps not quite so easily. Uh, in writing this book, I feel a bit of a cheat because from my background, my background certainly is in Afghanistan, but also the Near East. But Inner Asia is another world altogether. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because I knew nothing about it, um, which might sound odd, I mean, and I'm sure it shows in the book, but I wanted to find out more about it. There were several things that brought me on this journey. I do remember many, many years ago, one winter in Kabul in Afghanistan, traveling north over the Hindu Kush and getting beyond the Hindu Kush into northern Afghanistan and becoming aware of this endless, endless wide open step in front of me, real Central Asian step with these vast great skies. It was the middle of winter. Uh, I was camping in my Land Rover camper. Um, so I was you know, sleeping in that, in mazar -e sharif then just a small town. Um, you'd hear the wolves coming in off the steppe, um, howling in the streets of mazar -e I mean, real Dr. Zhivago stuff. And I felt drawn, you know, what's at the end of this endless, endless plain, this vast, great emptiness that lay before me. And I wanted to go and explore that. That was, of course, in the early 70s, and it was many, many years later that travel opened up in the areas of Inner Asia, um, northern China, Siberia, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, places like that. But the other thing that drew me to this, the subject of this book and the areas as well was the various exhibitions of Scythian gold that happened in the, well, 70s, 80s, 90s, well, there's exhibitions probably still continuing, this extraordinary rich gold artwork of the Scythians, amongst the finest artworks to have survived the ancient world. And I wanted to learn more about that. Now, as an archeologist, one's not so much interested in the object themselves. An archeologist is interested in the context and I wanted to see where all this Scythian artwork came. So that drew me deeper and deeper into the steppes of Inner Asia uh, to finally get to the source of this Scythian artwork, which was basically in remote areas of southern Siberia um, after many, many trips. For, and the last trip, in fact, was in 2019, uh, just before this book was going to press. So as a result of many, many journeys. Um, the third thing I wanted to find out about is what this endless step, how it affected Europe. We all know the origins of Europe, European civilization, European identity, European culture, and it almost invariably goes back to the Mediterranean and the ancient Near East. I don't diminish that at all, and quite the contrary, I've written about that elsewhere. But I was in this journey, I was becoming increasingly aware that so much of Europe, so much of European identity lies in the steppe, 
the steppe people, the various, in not, uh, not just invasions, it wasn't as simple as that, the various movements of people's ideas um, right across this vast endless steppe that doesn't make any borders at all. There's no, there's no difference, but at, at, in looking at this steppe, it rather questions the idea of Europe itself as a separate geographical context. Europe is wide open to influences from that step. In fact, in a, a recent um, leading article by Aris Rusopoulos, the foreign editor of uh, the journal Unheard, he gave a, a long discussion of this book in terms of trying to explain the Ukraine war. Now, I wouldn't go as far as that, but it certainly is the step that to some extent explains this, well, what's happening on the European step to this day. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint anything that really uh, comes into my memory. There was so much I encountered on those many, many different journeys, both journeys physically, geographically over this vast area, but also journeys in books, in libraries, in trying to find out the history and the archaeology of it. But there are probably three images that stick in my mind. One is in the city of Novosibirsk in Siberia, the Russian city. A busy street right in the center of it is a very small chapel, the Chapel of St. Nicholas, not a great Russian church or anything, that was built during the First World War um, as the geographical center of the Russian Empire. And this brought home to me, I mean, Novosibirsk, it's, I think, 1,200 miles east of the Urals. It's uh, several thousand miles east of Moscow. Novosibirsk is on the same longitude as Lucknow. And this was a geographical center of Russia. So it opened up this question, certainly, is Russia Europe? Is it Asia? Or are both those, rele both those definitions irrelevant? Ultimately, it asked, poses the question whether Europe itself and whether Asia are separate constructs. So that image was a very strong image in mind in writing this book. Uh, another very powerful image was a derelict Buddhist temple on the south part of the Volga River in Russia. And this Buddhist temple was built in, I think, 1818 by the commander of the Kalmuk Mongolian regiments that led the Russian forces into Paris in 1812 in the defeat of Napoleon. And the Russian, the Kalmyk commander of this force built a Buddhist temple on the Volga. I think the only Buddhist temple in the world built as a monument to the defeat of Napoleon. But the Kalmuks were, are a Mongolian people they now have their own republic within the Russian Confederation. Their official religion is Tibetan Buddhist. They are Mongolians, and they're it's a Mongolian republic within Europe. It's in the Russian Confederation, but it's west of the Urals. Very few people anywhere realize that Europe includes a Mongolian republic whose official religion is Tibetan Buddhist. And that very thing even opened up the question as to, again, what is Europe, what is European identity? So much associated with this idea of Christendom and Christianity as well. And there are various other odd things that came up in that quest. The third image that sticks in my mind is the Mongol capital of Kublai Khan, Xanadu. So you're dying for me to bring in your first book, aren't you, William, uh, in Xanadu? Which, in to, to, be, to be fair, that was the first book I read during my first trip to Xanadu in 2008. That was actually a witness, an eyewitness account of the site uh, by somebody who'd actually visited there. And in that same year, 2008, I happened to visit both Xanadu, the capital of Kublai Khan, at one end of this vast great Mongolian empire, and Sarai, Sarai, ba Sarai Batu, on the Volga River, right at the other end, the capital of the Golden Horde. And I don't know if you'll agree with me, William, but uh, Xanadu I found very, very moving because there's nothing there. 
absolutely nothing. There's just the endless grasses um, which the Mongols needed for their vast herds of horses on which their success depended. Um, and both Xanadu and Batu have that thing in common. There's nothing there. Pure emptiness. They were once great bustling capital cities. They're now more devoid of buildings than the cities that the Mongols themselves uh, destroyed. Just grass, vast sky, emptiness. And nothing brought home to me uh, more powerfully the, the impermanence of these vast great uh, steppe empires. So the aim of the book, I think I do on the first or second page, is um, just very, very simply, uh, my aim has been hopefully to attempt a synthesis, a consensus of the various topics, even though many of the subject, subjects, such as the Khazars or the questions of the Indo-European languages or the idea of the Amazon, the female woman, are uh, very controversial. And the study of others are still in their infancy and constantly changing in a state of flux. Uh, that question the old ones and new technologies enable new connections and conclusions to be made uh, that were unthinkable to previous generations. The subjects I discuss, therefore, are necessarily very selective. And I've emphasized that but the Eurasian step is as important as the effect on Europe as the Mediterranean or the Near East. The premise of this, therefore, is that the history, languages, ideas, art forms, peoples, nations, and identity of the steppe have shaped Europe, almost every aspect of the life of Europe, right down to our own day. Warwick, what I found fascinating in that opening section was this idea, which challenges everything that we've been brought up, that... Europe and Asia are something separate, that Europe somehow ends on the Bosphorus uh, and that uh, Asia then starts. And that's something which is so hardwired into our conception of geography that uh, I certainly had never even questioned the fact that, you know, that the Bosphorus is a break. But you very much resist that and you, and you bring to your uh, aid no greater uh, authority than Herodotus, yeah. who makes this point in, in, in the, what, second century, third century BC, that, in fact, the Bosphorus is, is an entirely random uh, uh, boundary, that there are many other places that you could uh, choose to end U Europe or bring in Asia or not have a boundary at all. You see it all as one Eurasia. Well, very much so. I mean, the very fact that two of the greatest civilizations, the Byzantine and the Ottomans, straddled that uh, so-called division, the, the Bosphorus itself. Um, the, well, the Ottomans are a very good case in point. The Ottomans are often viewed as the last great conquerors from Central Asia. But what is often forgotten is that the Ottomans conquered Constantinople not from the east, but from the west. And they then went on to conquer much of Anatolia and all of the ancient Near East from the west, from Constantinople. Um, in some ways, the Ottomans are viewed as the very last of these great Near Eastern empires, the successor of the Seljuks, the successor of the Caliphate before that, ultimately the successor of the Persian Empire. They, they saw themselves as of Rum. Exactly. Yeah. They were Romans. And in many ways, they were the successor of the Roman Empire. Um, they thought of themselves, they called themselves Caesars, and their conquest of the Near East was as much a Western conquest as the Roman Empire was. True, the Ottomans did practice a Near Eastern religion, but so in the end did the Romans. And, and so, do, so do people in this country. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You present your book as a succession of these, these different waves of, of migrants, the Indo-Europeans, the Scythians, the Huns, the Turks, the Khazars, the Mongols, the Tatars, and finally, perhaps controversially, the Russians. Uh, do you see a kind of a, a, a genetic link? I mean, are we talking, are they just different names for the same sea of peoples? Or are there, in fact, a distinct people you can call the Huns who are different from the Turks, who are different from the Mongols? Uh, no, there weren't many differences. Um, these names and these so-called waves, uh, first of all, they were almost invariably an east-west movement. 
And this has often been pointed down. I think it's been called um, the Eurasian ramp, uh, a movement constantly of east-west movement because of the warmer climate at the western end of Eurasia caused by the effects of the Gulf Stream. Uh, Siberia is extreme cold, and it doesn't have the, uh, uh, the warm temperatures that this western end. So people have constantly moved westwards, not because they're hot-wired to win, not because there's anything genetic or, or at all about that. It's just slightly warmer. Um, climatically. Of those different movements of peoples, uh, we are an Indian festival and, and certainly the most controversial in India and the most discussed, often very heatedly, is the Indo-Europeans. The archaeologists of the generation of Mortimer Wheeler and John Marshall depicted this as a, a, a horse uh, crazy martial race sweeping south into India uh, with their chariots and so on. Is, is, what's your view on this? Because it's now become a very hot topic of debate. It's uh, a hot potato, of course. It's hugely controversial. On one hand, it's been subject to quite extraordinary erudite scholarship. On the other hand, uh, it's formed the basis of a lot of uh, racial theories, even uh, white supremacists, Indo-European supremacists. It is a very hot potato, not only in India, of course, uh, but in Europe. The uh, scholar Maria Gimbutas, Lithuanian-American scholar, uh, saw the Indo-European invasions into Europe as killing off a, uh, a matriarchy, a European matriarchy, a pre-Indo-European matriarchy, and bringing with it aggressive masculine qualities that killed off this uh, supposed Arcadia. Uh, all of these theories are not only questioned, mostly have been disproved. The idea of languages, and behind that, the idea of an original Indo-European homeland is purely a theoretical construct. Um, it's There's not no a question people. that there are these mysterious were, links between Hindi and Sanskrit absolutely. And, and Latin and Greek. And yeah, and languages in ancient China as well. And this, the fact that the Indo-European languages are are so widespread has called into question the actual origin of the languages, whether there is a uh, discussion that they originated in India itself, uh, not a very big. It probably originated on either side of the Ural, so it's very much a, a Eurasian origin. But the one thing one has to emphasize above all in the movement of the and dispersal of the Indo-European languages is that they were just languages. They weren't peoples, they weren't invasions, uh, there weren't proto-colonialism at all. It is the movement of languages. The very fact that so many people in India, for example, speak English, and yet the descendants of English colonies are, colonists in India is tiny, suggests that it is a language of, a movement of languages, not. And when one thinks of the movement of, say, Indo-European languages into Europe, there wasn't a great mass movement of people at all out of some hole in the Urals uh, that wiped out all the uh, peoples in Europe. The peoples in Europe remained exactly the same. The languages gradually changed so that there's just a pocket of Basque now left of pre-Indo-European. One of the big changes in the scholarship on all this, of course, has been DNA studies. What, where has that left the Indo-Europeans? Uh, have they got a DNA or is that just nonsense? That is nonsense. Um, they've seen uh, origins of movements of people in the Yamnaya, uh, of the uh, Yamnaya culture, um, but of actual peoples themselves. DNA, well, uh, DNA studies, first of all, are very much in their infancy and have to be subject to a huge amount of cross-checking with all sorts of other uh, ideas. Um, but when DNA studies are undertaken, it shows surprising permanence of populations. There was not much movement. All of these movements, when they did come, were those of elites. Um, the Huns, for example, were an elite. It's left no mark. There was a lovely thing last week when one of the oldest burials that yielded DNA in this country, Cheddar Man, um, was... was the DNA was processed and they started doing a survey of guys in the village next door to it and they found there were direct, the yes. local history teacher yes. was exactly. descended from yes. Cheddar Bath. Yeah. Yes, e exactly. So DNA hasn't really proven that these, yeah, at all. 
So, but you still have people coming through, I mean, the old idea of people coming through SWAT down into India, what's left of that? There's, uh, yeah, there was a historical kingdom, a Scythian kingdom in northern India. What, what uh, period? Uh, in the first century BC, the kingdom of uh, Maui's. Um, again, we're talking of an, el an el elite. Uh, there, were, there were movements of people, of course, but there in, weren't in India mass called movements. the Sakas. The Sakas? Uh, the yeah. Sakas were a separate movement. Um, yeah, the Sakas is the... There were several movements of Sakas, which is in Indian uh, languages and in Persian, are the Scythians. Two movements came into India, one down through the Karakoram passes, settled in northern India, created a kingdom, um, and practiced the Gandharan art of the region. Another movement of Sakas came down through, well, western Afghanistan, down into Sistan, which was known as Sakistan, Sak country of the Sakas. Then moved eastwards uh, through Kandahar and then into the southern Indus region, where they formed another kingdom uh, called Indo Scythia in the classical sources, Sakadvipa in the Indian sources, and eventually disappeared. I mean, again, merged with the but population. If I remember of India. My, my history, I might well be wrong. The first public Sanskrit inscription is in, a, in, a, in Gujarat. Uh, in, uh, from an Indo-Saka. Indo-Saka, Indo yes, yes. So, yeah, they brought with them uh, certainly some language, but the oldest Saka inscriptions, I think, are in China, in Khotan. So, now we come to another of these people that have had their history much discussed and much rewritten, the Huns. When I went to school, the Huns were these sort of characters wearing sort of um, uh, furs and, uh, and fearsome looking people that, that, that burnt Rome in, in 410. But they're also, or are they not, the, the Hunnas who come in and destroy the Gandharan monasteries, the white Huns. Where, what, where do you, where's the current scholarship on Huns? Uh, the, the, certainly the Eastern Huns. The Western Huns that came in to put the nail into the coffin of the Roman Empire were certainly very destructive. The Eastern Huns and the f even further Eastern Huns, the Xunnu in China, have left their mark in the archaeological record. Uh, the Huns, the White Huns that came down through Afghanistan and into India, in historical records, they are very destructive. Mihirakula is the Indian Attila. Um, but that doesn't... That's not confirmed in the archaeological record. The there's, Huns, there's ambiguity isn't there, in the Chinese traveler. There's one Chinese traveler. Xuan Xiang, who, yes. No, no, Xuan Xiang says he's very violent. Yes. But there's another less well-known yeah. Chinese traveler who's more contemporary, who says Mihir Kula is a friend of the Buddhists. Um, exactly. Yeah. And um, there is this last great flourishing of Buddhist monuments in the area of Gandhara under various Hunnish kingdoms. The Huns... Uh, eventually merged into the population of India. In fact, according to one theory, the Huns became the, uh, the various warlike tribes of Rajasthan. The Rabaris traced yes. their ancestors. So probably. there's possibly Huns sitting in this room to this day. Could we have a show of hands of any Huns in the room? Well, in <laughs> well that, there you are, my, my theory exactly. And, uh, yeah, Jaipur is, uh, has yeah, a lot of Rabari exactly. blood yes. uh, around. Um, and the next up, the Turks. Uh, again, are we talking the same sort of DNA soup, the same sort of ethnic groups when, uh, when the Turks first appear very far from Turkey uh, and, and in, with the Northern Way, who are a Turkish group, get as far as Northern China? The Northern Way uh, were a steppe people. They had a, a Turk elite uh, known as the Tuoba. And they, the consensus is that they were Turks. When you're talking uh, ethnically, um, there are still Turks in China to this day, of course, uh, most controversially, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Um, if you get a Turk from there and stand him next to a Turk in Constantinople, they're two very, very different people. And yet Uyghur but speak and modern Turkish are very mutually comprehensible. A lot of the basic words still... I had a very interesting experience when digging in northern Afghanistan. Uh, next to the site I was working at, uh, there was a huge big Chinese construction camp. My workforce in Iraqi workforce were drawn from a nearby town, Tel Afa, which was Turkish, Turkish speaking. 
Um, I had to negotiate with the chief Chinese engineer at one point about how they were affecting archaeological sites and so forth. Uh, I had my work with, with them. Uh, very complicated negotiations through my uh, Iraqi counterpart with the Chinese Iraqi counterpart who eventually got into Chinese. So all through three languages. My Turkish workmen wandered off and got bored. An hour later, when I went to find them, they came back saying, they're not Chinese here, they're Turks, just like us. And amongst the Chinese workforce were a group of uh, Uyghurs. So they were just able to communicate. And it, it, it makes a nonsense, of course. Um, and the same with, like, back to Indo-Europeans. If you get a Bengali and somebody from Ireland standing next to each other, they're obviously very, very different people. The languages are connected, but we're not talking peoples at all. In your wonderful earlier book, on East of Rome, you make the point that the Northern Way are the people who first gigantify images of the Buddha, that these, these great, huge mega-Buddhas that you get in the Northern Way territories in Northern China then get built later by other Turkic tribes in Bamiyan. Do you still, is that still? Very much yeah. so. In fact, I've got a paper coming out on that for, well, that expands on that uh, in a collection published by the Getty later this year, um, where I try and explain this idea of giganticism at Bamiyan, trace it back certainly to the Northern Way in Northern China, um, and trace that to possible Chinese ideas of dynasticism as well linking it in with, I don't know, Persian aspects, but rather more controversially, I make the link with Ottoman Constantinople, where the Ottoman sultans, like the Northern Way, combined both secular and religious authority and expressed it in constructing huge, great mosque complexes. Constantinople is unique amongst Islamic cities in that it has many, many different giant mosque complexes. No other city has it. And the Northern Way leaders identify their own leaders with the Buddha. You have the Admetria. Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana. yes, Mahayana. yes. Because of that element in Mahayana that combined religious and secular authority. So they built giant Buddhas, these Turk rulers, giant Buddhas that represented both Buddha, standing Buddha, but also their own authority. And that is exactly what the Buddhas of Bamiyan are about, built by another Turkish dynasty. Quite late. Quite late in the 7th and 8th centuries, yes. And uh, again, very recent scholarship um, by um, a particularly American scholar, Deborah Klimberg Salter, has emphasized this last great flourishing of Buddhism in the Hindu Kush that uh, coincided with the arrival of Islam right down to the 11th century. And then, again, for, for an Indian audience, this surprising Hindu Shahi dynasty that celebrates Shaivism in Kabul. That's right, yes. And it was, Ghazni. It was with, eclectic. With, with yeah. um, Durga as, uh, appearing in some yes. of the earliest incarnations in Ghazni in Afghanistan. That's right. And Shiva being worshipped under what's now some of the Sufi shrines in the center of Kabul. Exactly. Um, and this last great flourishing of, uh, well, both Indian and uh, Hinduism and Buddhism under the Hindu Shahis and the Turkish Shahis uh, coincided with the arrival of a new Muslim Turkish dynasty, the Ghaznavids. So all it was, uh, and again, it's a case I've made in another paper coming out, is that the Turk elites simply changed religion. They weren't new Turks at all. There was the old ones, oh well, Islam's the fashion today, let's follow that instead of uh, Buddhism or Hinduism. One of the things I'm writing about in my new book, The, uh, the Golden Road, is the Barma kids, who are the Pramukhs, the, 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 the Buddhist yeah. um, uh, hereditary leaders of the Naubaha Monastery in Balkh, who then convert to Islam. One of their members is studying maths in Srinagar, and they convert to Islam, go to Rasafa in Syria, where they are uh, introduced to the court circle as hostages. And then it is a Bama kid, uh, one of the, one of the, the sons, Khalid al Bamak, who builds Baghdad and becomes the viziers for the Abbasids, bringing Indian learning from Ujjain. And how, that's how the Arab, the, sorry, the Indian number system reaches Baghdad and eventually then spreads across the Islamic world so that when it reaches Europe, we call it Arabic numbers.
Exactly. Well, the great uh, Central Asian polymath, Al Biruni, actually wrote that in former days, Buddhism spread all the way to uh, Aleppo. Um, Do you think that was right? Uh, no, I don't think so. But this whole idea of uh, the Barmakids were, as you say, they were great promoters of Buddhism. There was this idea that Buddhism spread into Iran. Uh, one only has to remember that the edicts of Ashoka, of an earlier generation, the first spread of Buddhism out of India, the edicts of Ashoka uh, claimed that Buddhist proselytizers were sent as far west as the Mediterranean, as far west as Cyrene, as far west as Cyrene Greece. being Libya. In Cyrene in Libya, yes, and converted the inhabitants to Buddhism. I mean, it was an empty claim nonetheless. But there were many, many elements of Buddhism that did spread westwards at this time. One only has to remember that Buddhism spread west before it spread east. It spread west from uh, the borderlands of Nepal to northwestern India, and then into Central Asia before it spread eastwards eventually to the Far East. After lunch today, I'm going to be speaking with Tom Holland about some of this and the new finds in Berenike where a new Buddha has turned up on the, on the port between the Red Sea and Egypt. Um, so next up, after the, we've done the Indo-Europeans, Scythians, Huns and Turks, next up, the Khazars. The Khaz mysterious Jewish convert, Mongol, I mean, yes, sept, Turk, the Turk. The Khazars are a huge hot potato. Um, one of the things that brought it into publicity was the British-Hungarian author, novelist, Arthur Kursler, in the 1970s, he wrote a very controversial book, The Thirteenth Tribe. A, the Dictionary he, of the Khazars. I know, where he wrote that this uh, huge, great Judaic empire um, many people in the West have never heard of that there was a Jewish empire on the borderlands of Europe and Asia. Even many Jews themselves have never heard of it. But it was very, very true, a huge empire. But with its breakdown, uh, elements of the Khazars went westwards into Eastern Europe and became the Ashkenaz. Uh, and Ashkenaz simply means Scythian, so people of the steppes. And so Kersler was arguing that the Ashkenaz, Ashkenazi Jews are descendants of this Turk Jewish empire and not from the original diaspora out of uh, that I Israel. That didn't go down very uh, well. That is, of course, hugely controversial. And again, I think largely irrelevant to Jewish identity. I, I don't think it's uh, all that important. But there are a few things, several things that came out of this. In the end of the 10th century, when Prince Vladimir of Kiev, and Vladim well, Vladimir is a name that comes up every day now in the news, both Vladimir and Volodir, uh, Volodymyr, um, the two presidents, um, because of his, um, he was the beginning of Russian Orthodox religion. But before Vladimir converted, he was looking around for, uh, the, the Russians at that time were, were pagans, uh, but all of these steppe peoples always fell to the attraction of one of the great world religions. The Mongols became Buddhist. Uh, the, many of the Mongol empires some of became... The, some of the Mongols became Muslim. Muslim yeah. as well. The Yohanids and the Golden Horde became Muslim. So there was an always an attraction of the great universal religions. And Vladimir was looking around. What religion should we Russians uh, adopt? And first of all, he consulted... The Khazars, or maybe Judaism, that's uh, a good thing to do. And then the Bulgars, not the Bulgarians of Bulgaria today, the first Bulgar kingdom was on the upper Volga River in Russia, and they were Muslim. And they uh, wrote to Vladimir and said, well, uh, Islam, that's a good universal religion. Why not adopt that? Think of the what-ifs behind that, if the Russians had adopted Judaism or Islam instead of Russian orthodoxy. orthodoxy. There was no inevitability at all about it. The fact that it is Russian orthodox is historical circumstance. Like so much that I bring about in this book, so much is historical circumstance, not inevitability. Now, the Mongols obviously are, are the ones we think of in Europe as being the, the greatest, the, the most sort of destructive, um, the most powerful of all the Central Asian uh, nomadic groups. 
is, does that again still stand, or are the Huns, you know, equally fearsome and equally wide-ranging? I opened my chapter on the Mongol invasions by comparing the Mongol period with the 20th century, and quote various prominent authors. And this is, you know, soon after the millennium, when so many books talked about the 20th century, the two world wars, the Holocaust, as the most destructive period in all of history. And I list lots of quotations about that. And then I compare that with the Mongol invasions and say, no. Uh, the 20th century was a period also of resurgence, of superabundance, of overproduction. Well, we're getting the climatic uh, problems of that to our cost now. And the two most defeated nations, Germany and Japan, were the first to bounce back and become prosperous. The most destructive period in history was undoubtedly the era of the Mongol invasion. And I quote statistics in that. It was absolute, unbelievable destruction. Uh, so much so... In case anyone invasion. isn't familiar with it, starts off... It, well, tell, tell the, a, a brief history of the Mongols. Well, uh, very, very briefly, um, a new kingdom in Central Asia, the Khwarezm Shahs, uh, a delegation was sent to them, a peaceful delegation of traders by Genghis Khan. Uh, the Khwarezm king had them all butchered. So Genghis Khan sent another delegation demanding restitution. He had them humiliated and killed as well. That set Genghis Khan in motion westward. But the destruction was It never... reaches, what, as far as Poland? Oh, it reaches further than Poland. It reaches as far as the Adriatic. Uh, it reaches as far as just to the west of Vienna, at uh, Wiener Leibniz. It's, uh, yes, it was huge. And there is no doubt, with its main invasion of Europe, all of the senior Mongol commanders were in charge of it. Uh, in charge was a, Genghis Khan's favorite grandson, Batu. Two future great Khans were there, but also Subadai, uh, his military genius, was there. And there is no doubt that what the armies of China and Islam could not withstand, there is no doubt that they would have swept all of Europe before them and would have reached the Atlantic. What stopped them, what gave Western Europe an 11th hour reprieve, was the death of the great Khan in Mongolia. So all of these leaders had to return to Mongolia to decide on the succession. And Europe was given a breathing space. But what's not... There were conflicts, though. There were moments when European knights in Hungary are facing oh, Mongol... Indeed. Uh, King Bela IV of Hungary had to flee. His uh, country was completely overrun. Uh, the great battle in uh, Poland, 1241, Europe sent its best army against them, um, a combined force which was completely annihilated by a smaller Mongolian force. But the reprieve happened. What we don't realize, though, that the Mongols came, they conquered, and they remained. And the Mongols set up kingdoms within Europe. First of all, the western arm of the Mongol Empire, the Golden Horde, uh, conquered all of the Russian states. The only one that withstood them was uh, Novgorod, mainly because of the marshes that surround Novgorod itself. But all of the other Russian states, which were disunited, there was no central Russian kingdom at that time, all the Russian petty states were picked off one by one by the Mongols. And the Golden Horde was established. What we don't realize is that the Golden Horde... Horde, we should quickly say, is the same word as Urdu. Urdu, Horde, yeah. yes. It means Urdu, army. Um, it eventually disintegrated, but in the end, there were five Mongol states in Europe. The Golden Horde shrank. Uh, there was a successor Mongol Khanate in Kazan on the middle Volga. Another one at Astrakhan, at the lower Volga, on the shores of the Caspian. Uh, the Khanate of Crimea in the Black Sea, and a fifth one, a rather curious one, the Khanate of Kasimov to the west of Moscow, which was a Mongol Khanate actually created by Muscovy itself to help friendly Mongols and act as a buffer state against Kazan. So you rather controversially and enjoyably for the reader link modern Russia as the last of the great Eurasian steppe empires. Well, indeed it was. It was certainly, to a large extent, the creation of it. And by the 15th century, there was this rather curious 
two axes right across Eastern Europe and, and the Russian steppe. There was a great power of the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth to the north. That allied itself with the Khanate, the Mongol Khanate of Astrakhan to the south, while the up-and-coming power of Muscovy allied itself with the Khanate of Crimea on the Black Sea. So there was these two opposing axes right across Eastern Europe that cut across religious, uh, ethnic, and cultural lines that contradicted and, each other. And you have a very nice thing in the book where, um, although that the Mongols never made it to Western Europe, um, the, the products of Mongol biological warfare does. Ah, yes. The first instance of biological warfare recorded at the Mongol siege of the Genoese port at Kaffa. Um, where on the, the Crimea. On the, in the Crimea, in the Black Sea. The Mongols lobbed decapitated heads over the walls, which were infected with the Black Death. And a Genoese ship it then spread into the port of Kaffa. A Genoese ship then left and at first put shore in Sicily and from Sicily. With some the of the sailors spread, already dying already at the oars. Already dying. Yeah. And uh, uh, destroyed anything up to two thirds of the population of Europe. The other, far more destructive than the Mongol hordes themselves brought to Europe, was of course gunpowder uh, that was brought to Europe by the Mongols as well, even though the Mongols themselves hardly used it. But so it was quickly in, your, in your scheme, can we look on, on Vladimir Putin as the direct descendant, spiritually or genetically, with, of the uh, Attila the Hun and uh, Genghis Khan, or was that a mistake? Uh, certainly not. Um, Vladimir, Vladimir Putin is Russian. But I do talk a lot about Russian identity and how Russian identity has been the product of the steppe. Uh, many Russians tend to ignore the, the Tatar yoke, as they call it. But the very fact that there were Mongol kingdoms ruling in Europe for over 500 years, um, that effect has an enormous effect on Russia. The very last kingdom to fall was the Kingdom of Crimea under Shagin Khan, which uh, went over to Catherine the Great in, I think, 1789, the very last time. And Crimea, the Mongol Kingdom of Crimea ruled for 300 years, but that was the very last time that a descendant of Genghis Khan ruled a European kingdom. So we have 10 minutes for questions, but first of all, please, an extraordinary round of applause for this gallop across history. Uh, Over to you guys, at the front. Can we have a, a microphone? Mr. Ball, do you mean General uh, Kornilov who built uh, Buddha Temple in uh, a Kalmyk person? Uh, he was called General Tumen. He was a Kalmyk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, because Kornilov also was a Kalmyk, and uh, uh, he was a little later from the time, and he built, uh, he was also a Buddhist, and uh, still uh, uh, Kalmyk and have Buddhism as a main religion. And my second question, when we are speaking in Europe about Kiev, Kiev was the capital of old Russia. First and second, Hazaran, they have own uh, uh, territory in Kiev. Kiev was a, a principality. Um, one of the many Russian principalities at the time. Its original foundation was Viking. Uh, but then, then a, again, the Vikings were absorbed into the native... The Rus. The Rus, the, into Rus, the native, native yeah. Russian po Slavic population. But there were many other principalities as well. Uh, Smolensk, Tver, uh, Muscovy itself, Vladimir. There were, many, there were lots of different Russian principalities. Kiev was one of them. It was the first to convert to Christianity. That's what made it so important. Vladimir has taken Byzantine Christianity. Uh, he became Orthodox. On that time, Kiev was the capital of Drevnia Rus. Yes. Well, yes. This is what gives the Russians uh, uh, this right for Kiev. You know, this is the beginning of the war. When the uh, war began and the British people asked me, I said, please keep in your mind, it was the capital of old Russia. Yes, yes. Next question. This gentleman. Go 
Ifrit. Uh, what role has social structures played social structures played in the movement of ideas across the step what role has social structures played in the movement of ideas sorry this is social structures uh, the idea of uh, certainly with these different tribes different peoples they were peoples rather than tribes um, central chains of command was a very strong characteristic. This is why uh, whenever there was a movement out of the steppe, these various steppe peoples, uh, Scythians all the way through to Mongols, were usually able to defeat the great sedentary empires on the fringes, um, Persian, Roman, whatever, because the life of the steppe nomad uh, depended on very, very rigid cha chains of command uh, they also were in constant movement, uh, moving about. Uh, they also, in order to survive, it was a very harsh environment. So they had a very, very cohesive social structure, which did make them very powerful and able to um, conquer many of the different peoples on the fringes. Does that answer the question? Another social aspect uh, of the steppe people was the very high empowerment given to women uh, women were generally of a far very more important chapter equal, of your book. Yeah. Equal chap far more equal status to the more sedentary city dwellers on the fringes. This is because simply to survive on the steppe, women had to have an important part in, in everyday life. The women rode, uh, many of the women rode to warfare as well, um, simply in order to survive. And this um, is reflected even in uh, even later Muslim societies, and I talk about the Ottoman women uh, in one part in the book, how Ottoman women had a, a far higher social status even than many women in 18th and 19th century Europe. So social cohesion and the empowerment of women were certainly two very social aspects that came. This lady here. What happens to the Khazars uh, after the, they accepted Judaism as a, as a new religion? What happens to the Judaism in that area? Did they convert to another one or disperse? Yes, uh, a combination of dispersal and conversion to Islam, uh, later conversion to Christianity. Uh, but many remained also in this area. A strong center of Judaism in Central Asia uh, was Bukhara. Um, and there are various strands of Judaism that came into Bukhara, possibly from the Khazars, but possibly from the earlier Persian Empire as well, from the original diaspora. We should uh, turn to our sponsors, the, the Aga Khan Trust, who were doing up, when ah. I was in Herat, were restoring the many synagogues of Herat. Yes. So there was, and still is, or until very recently, uh, large pockets of Judaism within Central Asia. Uh, another pocket of Judaism survived to this day in Crimea. These are the Karaim Jews, um, who are a very distinct, uh, distinct group of Jews. In fact, many mainstream Jews don't regard them as quite Jewish as, at all. But they survived, uh, and still survive today, speaking a, uh, a Turk dialect as well. So pockets remained. Farouk, at the back. Wait, sir, for the... Uh, thank you, William. You were talking, uh, Mr. Ball, about the 13th tribe earlier, and you were saying uh, whether they were the original 12 tribes, i.e. the Ashkenazi or not, doesn't really matter. So are you saying implicitly that uh, the Ashkenazi are also descendants of the Khazars? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. I am just reiterating. You said what, a, what an author said a, a in the theory, 1970s. A theory that there is, and I've tried to, in, throughout, tread a very central line, and to give what, to give the controversy, to open the controversy up. Uh, and this is what I've done in, well, the chapter on the Indo-Europeans, for example. I've not come down on any particular side. I've just given the various often very controversial and sometimes quite extreme sides. So I'm not in a position to state whether the Ashkenazi are the original tribes or not, but I do give the controversy. 
One last question. Will we close? Any more? Yes, madam. Sharupa, we need a second microphone. Sorry. Hi. Uh, do you think the migration uh, of people has uh, helped in the ideas moving along as well? For instance, uh, Hinduism, it was not allowed to transgress the borders of India. So uh, Chinese scholars, Hun Sang and all the people took the ideas to, let's say, the Middle East or wherever. And those ideas have migrated with people. Do you think the empathy continues among the people because of the previous migrations of their ancestors, or you don't think so? Uh, I'm not really in a position to say much because I do, don't really know much about India. Um, certainly, Hinduism did travel. It travelled to to Java, didn't to it? Cambodia, and you Cambodia. have in Cambodia um, under the Pasupatas coming over in large numbers. And, and you, when you go to Cambodia today, you can find areas where the riverbeds have been converted into yoni lingams. Yeah. And the idea is to extend the holy land of India into this area and to give it names like Kurukshetra, yes. Ayodhya, yes. which are associated with the epics. And yes. so notionally extend the holy land out of the geography of, uh, of the, beyond the Ganges. Yes, but uh, you also have the migration of, let's say, the Cholas who went to Malaysia and converted to Islam eventually, and those kingdoms continued. Uh, we do have the palaces renamed as Islamic uh, centers. Uh, the idea is just that the do Cholas, you think the empathy the Cholas, as, as regards I mean, uh, the, as, from the south. Question yeah. Mark. Uh, yeah, as regards in Malacca, there is a palace. Oh, sorry, in 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 in, in um, Malacca, uh, Southeast Asia. Yes, yes sorry. Yes, 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 I thought you meant in Tamil Nadu. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no, no. As as regards ideas, and I always really emphasise that it's ideas that move more than actual peoples. Um, well, William's already spoken about the alphabet, of course. Uh, no, sorry, Numbers. the numerical the, the numerical system. In a separate book, I have talked about various ideas, various aspects of Roman architecture, Roman imperial architecture, uh, particularly the Roman imperial architecture of the East, of ideas in that that came from India. Um, I wrote a book about it, so far too long to it's explain It's a wonderful, here. wonderful book, and, and so, we must get Warwick back another day to talk <laughs> about it, the, the Rome in the East, where he traces the extraordinary influence of, of Roman statuary, also uh, images of Augustus and so on, on early conceptions of the Buddha in Gandhara. Uh, and if it's, anyone wants to pursue that, I recommend Warwick's work um, with, with an absolutely electrifying section of that book. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end. Please, a big round of applause for the most wide-ranging in time and space session we've had here ever, I think, in our, in our festival. Thank you.